Welcome. My name's Heidi and I'm the Family, Local and Military History Librarian for our Eastern Regional Libraries. And today we're joining all of you and we're grateful to welcome Anthony McAleer, our wonderful local author, who's fairly prolific in his writings, which is great to see because it highlights the incredible history of our area. We've also got Dr. Bart Zinio, is that pronounced correctly? Zeno. Oh. Zeno, who is the senior lecturer at Deakin University. So, and they'll be talking about the book Homefront. And let me just give you a brief introduction on each of these lovely gentlemen. So Anthony's worked for Museums Victoria for the past 21 years where he currently manages the dedicated customer service team at the Immigration Museum. For the last 30 years, he's been involved in numerous community groups, mainly local history societies and the RSL clubs. He's written 24 books so far, edited three, mainly to do with history of the Yarra Valley, including his detailed accounts of the area's military heritage and the history of Lilydale's Athenaeum Theatre buildings. He's been responsible for the creation of some 60 memorials in the Yarra Valley area, mainly recognising the district's military history. His achievements include being awarded the Shire of Yarra Rangers Citizen of the Year in 1997, a Casey Electorate Special Community Service Achievement Award in 2016 and 2018. He received a Medal of the Order of Australia for Outstanding Community Service for Achievements in Military History. Anthony is author of this new book, Homefront, The Impact of World War I on the Shire of Lilydale. And we'll be hearing a lot more about that today. So, Dr. Bart Zino is our special guest, and he has written and researched much of Australia's involvement in World War I, including publishing his brilliant book, the Distanced Grief, Australian War Graves and the Great War. And he's currently finishing off a comprehensive history of Australia's World War I history. Bart is also a local boy, having grown up in Mount Evelyn. And we are very pleased to have him with us to officially launch the book for the Mount Evelyn RSL sub-branch today. Hopefully we'll also be joined by Matt Crimble who is the president of the Mount Evelyn RSL sub-branch. And he served for many years with the Royal Australian Navy before, before coming a customs officer with Australian Customs and Border Protection Service. At this moment, he's on active service on a ship somewhere off the coast of Australia. And hopefully he will be able to join us at some point today. So without further ado, let's welcome Anthony. Thank you very much, Heidi. Thank you. Now I'm just going to test my share a screen. I'll, hopefully that will come up. Uh, can you see that? We can. Yes. Excellent. All right. I'll see if I can get this up and running. Okay. And you can see that okay? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. All right. Well, look, this book uh, details the story of uh, what happened on the home front during the First World War. For those that lived in the, the various farming communities that uh, then made up what was known as the, the Shire of Lilydale. It was uh, a significant era in the, the history of the district and at a time when a global event took priority over nearly all aspects of local life. It impacted schools, community groups, churches, commerce, pastime, sport, life on the land, and it certainly placed burdens on old and young, male and female, urban and rural. There was no one who was not affected by it. But not only that, the First World War would go on to reverberate for decades and even generations after peace was declared. 
and it placed a dark cloud over the community for a very long time. Now, this book has uh, come about as a result of the, uh, of the stories that were collected during the recent centenary of World War I commemorations. And with the, uh, the support of the Department of Veterans Affairs Armistice uh, Centenary Grant Program, the Mount Evelyn RSL decided to record this history permanently and for the community by uh, publishing this book. And okay. Now, as a way of explanation, this map shows the Shire of Lilydale and Lilydale being spelt with two L's, signifying the Shire, the Shire rather than the town, um, as it looked back in 1994, when it was forced to amalgamate with uh, other shires to form the Shire of Yarra Ranges. Now, during World War I, the Shire did include the two large townships of Ringwood and Croydon, which later seceded to form their own local government authorities in the decades that followed. However, for this study, I have stuck to the Shire's geographical boundaries as they were in 1994, and as you uh, see here. At the time, it was considered to be a rural area. It wasn't then a part of the Melbourne uh, uh, metropolitan area. As the major township in the area, Lilydale was the social and political centre of the Shire. It was the site of a regional uh, railway junction. The line from Melbourne finished here, and then two more tracks branched off from Lilydale one to Hillsville and one to Warburton. Now, some of the, uh, these lines had stations at townships in the Shire, which uh, allowed farmers there to transport their produce to Melbourne. It also had an extensive strip of uh, stores and uh, hotels, as well as, a, as well as significant industries such as the Cave Hill Limestone Quarry and Works. It also had the largest population of residents and was the closest the Shire had to an urban landscape. The other townships that made up the Shire included such places as Murrelbark, Coldstream and Yering, which were then made up of properties with large paddocks for grazing sheep and dairy cattle, or for growing crops or cultivating wineries. Wonga Park, Gruyere, Seville, Wandon, Sylvan and Kilsyth were all farming communities where the selectors had mostly grown orchards on their blocks, mainly fruit and berries, and some had sown fields with vegetables. Mount Evelyn, Montrose, Alinda, Mount Dandenong and Mombolk were villages made up of selectors who had cleared out their blocks, cleared their blocks out of the forests in the Dandenong Ranges and they were mostly growing fruits, mainly small berries. Now, each township was unique in its own way, but they were also similar in that each had established their own state school, their own community hall, cricket or football team, and had built at least one Christian church, and they had a post office and or a general store. They were very community-minded townships, and would commonly band together to help each other or form a progress association to develop the town's facilities. Transport was limited, although some had a railway to travel on. Only the wealthy drove cars. There were no bus services. So you either rode a horse or you had one pull a cart for you, or you walked. There was no electricity, not even in Lilydale, no radios very few telephones, and you found out most things by attending a public meeting or reading the local newspaper, the Lilydale Express, or you may receive news via letters or cablegrams. As a result, they were communities that were very insular, where those that resided in the small townships usually lived, worked, socialised, worshipped, played sport or were educated not far from home. But this also made them loyal to their hometown and very supportive of each other. Now, the war didn't burst upon the Shire overnight. 
distant rumblings had been there for a long time. The buildup of our defence forces in the years before the war included the formation of local units of the Light Horse, as well as the creation of rifle clubs. The most significant move during this time was the organisation and development of the Royal Australian Navy, due much to the efforts of Vice Admiral Sir William Rook Creswell, pictured here, who was known as the father of the Australian Navy. In 1913, Creswell purchased the large property and homestead in the Shire, uh, in the Shire at Sylvan, which he used as his country estate up until his death in 1933. Another famous resident in the Shire was Madame Nellie Melba, the world famous soprano opera singer, whose home was at Coombe Cottage at Coldstream. Melba was the only person in the Shire, if not in Australia, who, either, who had either met or were friends with most of the European royalty who were stoking the fires of the coming war. And she had uh, certainly she'd met uh, Kaiser Wilhelm and she was very good friends with uh, with King George. Now, as the rumblings of war grew louder in Europe, steps were taken by the federal government to train young men in military techniques by creating compulsory service in militia units. One of these, the 13th Infantry Brigade, hosted a large annual camp of instruction just before the war, where uh, the Lilydale Lake is today. And that uh, bottom picture, that shows um, the, uh, where the camp was. And as I said, that's where the Lilydale Lake is today. Now, some 3,200 soldiers attended this in the February before the war began. And it was commanded by a famous soldier by the name of Colonel John Monash. The famous uh, British General Sir Ian Hamilton came out and inspected the camp and uh, watched them uh, hold a mock battle out near Coldstream. He was later in charge of our troops at Gallipoli. And that uh, top picture of all the, uh, the soldiers, including the Victorian Scottish Regiment uh, marching is taken uh, in the main street of Lilydale. And at the, the back there, they're just crossing over the, uh, the bridge where the Alinda Creek is. Now the first residents of the, uh, the Shire to experience the war firsthand was a Lilydale girl by the name of Zola Jansen, pictured here. Zola was in Germany at the time that the Archduke was assassinated in Sarajevo, and she had to undertake a dramatic escape by train out of Germany and onto France and England. The first resident to go into active service in the war was Sister Alice Card of Alinda, who was serving as a nurse at the American Hospital in Paris and was on duty there when war was declared on August 4th, 1914. The first volunteer for the military was a gentleman by the name of Alfred Niblett from Lilydale, who was on the Imperial Army Reserve List, and he reported for duty to the British Consulate on August 10th, 1914. The following day in England, 19-year-old Harold Hughes of Montrose, pictured here in the centre, um, who was studying at university there, enlisted in the British Army. On August 16th, Stoker James McClure of Yering was serving on HMA's Pioneer when they captured a German merchant ship. He was the, uh, the first man from the Shire to actually see action in the war. And on the same day, 26-year-old Ralph Good from Lilydale, pictured on the, the right here, uh, enlisted in the AIF. He was the first man from both Lilydale and the Shire to enlist in the AIF. Now, by the end of 1914, 117 men from the Shire had enlisted in the AIF, and many of them had already been sent overseas to Egypt. Now, when the war began, there was a predetermined role for what men had to play in the conflict. But for women, there was no major task outside of nursing that was conceived for them. And as a result, they had to create their own avenues of involvement in the war. Patriotic funds committees were formed early on, but what attracted most women was the Red Cross Society. On the same day that the Australian Red Cross Society was formed in Melbourne, a branch was formed at Lilydale, and Madame Melba 
was elected its president. And uh, Melba is uh, seated in the, the centre there. This is the Lilydale Red Cross branch. And they're out the front of the, uh, the Athenaeum building. Now, Melba's role with the local branch was more as patron than uh, president. She didn't undertake the uh, administrative duties. That was done by the vice president, Mrs. Amy Syme. And she certainly didn't sew or knit. She admitted she didn't have those skills. But Melba had other unique and exemplary talents, and she used these gifts and her list of contacts more successfully in the service of the empire's patriotic causes during the war years than any other individual in Australia would. Her series of wartime performances across five countries meant she raised more funds for the Red Cross than anyone else. She was later awarded the title of Dame Commander of the British Empire as a result. It's interesting to note that she was uh, she received that award for her wartime um, sort of um, efforts rather than for her uh, achievements um, as a, an opera singer. Now, before the uh, the end of 1914, Red Cross branches were formed at Coldstream at Wonga Park and Mount Dandenong. And women throughout the, the Shire knitted, sewed and created articles to be sent to the boys overseas or they undertook fundraising to purchase items to send. Of all the appeals that had begun in the early part of the war, the ones that focused on Belgium were the most popular. Belgium had been invaded and was under the heel of the German aggressors and horrible stories were coming out regularly about the atrocities that were happening to the people there. Helping Belgium felt like an immediate way of assisting in the war. Belgian relief funds were set up all over the Shire and fundraising events such as the sports carnival and uh, jumble sale in Lilydale and weekly house to house collections took place, raising a huge amount of money. The car that you see here is uh, decorated for uh, a fundraising uh, parade in, uh, uh, for the, the Belgian relief fund that was in Lilydale. However, by mid-1915, appeals for European war victims were pushed into second place when our men went into action on Gallipoli and were in need of our support. Another immediate reaction to the war was the attitude to those of a Germanic heritage. Locally, some German families anglicised their name to avoid negative attention while others had their sons enlist in the AIF to show where their loyalty lay. German attitude peaked in 1915, when a public meeting was organised to discuss the best way to deal with the treatment of Germans, Austrians and Turks. At this meeting, they passed a resolution asking the government to intern them all. Throughout the war, local Germans found it hard to get employment and some had to register and report regularly to the police station. In the Dandenongs, vigilantes were organised to keep watch on one German who it was rumoured was signalling to ships in Port Phillip Bay from a tower next to his home. The most extraordinary story, though, is of Robert Shell from Lilydale, who's the baby-faced soldier pictured here. Now, while he was serving on the, the Western Front, he discovered a former school friend from the Lilydale State School amongst a group of German prisoners of war. The poor fellow had gone to Germany before the war to visit family, had been caught up uh, there when the war started, and then had been conscripted into the German army. An extraordinary um, uh, moment where two school friends meet on uh, the Western Front and uh, they're both serving in different armies. Now, most of the, uh, the local men who had enlisted in 1914 were fit single men, and so, and so many had enlisted that the AIF could afford to be choosy, rejecting many on physical grounds. One poor fellow from Mombok was rejected on account of the poor condition of his teeth. He then went and had them all pulled out at his own expense, and he returned to the recruiting depot with new false teeth only to be told that he, as he had no teeth of his own, they couldn't take him. Those um, who were enlisted in early 1915 tended to be young men not so impulsive as the earlier enlistees, but who had given the situation some thought. 
Men like Lilydale's James Burns, seen here on the, the left-hand side, who had just finished uh, at Scotch College and was about to go on to university. Not long after enlisting, he wrote a poem called The Bugles of England that summed up his feelings for why he enlisted. When it was published, the poem was a huge hit with the general public, and it went on to become the most well-received and widely read piece of Australian war verse to have ever been written. Now, the numbers of enlistments for the AIF continued to grow locally throughout 1915, especially after the landing at Gallipoli, where the Shire experienced its first casualties. Now, to soften the blow for those at home, when a telegram arrived telling a family that a loved one had been killed, it was decided that the local clergyman would be the one to deliver the sad news. For Lilydale's Presbyterian minister, the Reverend Hugh Burns, the first telegram he had to deliver was to himself. When his son, the poet James Burns, who um, I was just talking about and who's pictured here, was sadly killed in action on Gallipoli in September. The Gallipoli casualty list soon began to discourage enlistments. And as a re result, recruitment drives and public meetings were organized to get more local men to enlist. White feathers started being distributed at this time as well. And soon married men were also enlisting in large numbers. With our men in action at Gallipoli, the work of the Red Cross became more important and gained much support and more willing helpers. An Australian Wounded Soldiers Fund was also started at Wandon. And by the end of the year, this group was organising to bring sick and wounded soldiers who had returned home out to the area for excursions in a collection of cars. Local patriotic organisations would then arrange to host them for lunch and entertain them at the, uh, the local hall. And this hall was uh, the, uh, the local hall at Coldstream, uh, which uh, sadly is no longer there. One of the most uh, effective organisations for raising funds and producing supplies to assist our men was the Victorian Education Department, who developed the state school system into a means of supporting the war effort. Students came up with their own ways of raising money, such as holding concerts and patriotic events, growing flowers and vegetables to sell, or they knitted and created items to be sent off overseas or to military hospitals. This image uh, here is of the, uh, the Wandon Girls Guild, um, and they're all dressed um, as uh, representatives of various nations in the war. And uh, this was done for a, uh, a local fundraising event. As recruiting was ramped up, local patriots looked at sporting teams as a repository for physically fit men. So they began to aim their appeals directly at local sportsmen. In 1915, 25 players from the Lillardale Football Club decided to join up together and they marched off to the, uh, the railway station behind a banner that said, join us and help win the final at Gallipoli. At Mombolk, all members of their 1914 football team successfully enlisted, except for the captain, who was rejected on medical grounds. In the end, the recruitment of local sportsmen proved so successful that teams were drained of players, so much so that by the end of 1915, most of the district spectator sports would have to be cancelled for the duration of the war. When the government banned any trade with the enemy nations, some local industries were affected. However, others were lucky enough to gain war contracts, like the Evelyn Jam Company at Wandon, who, won a, who were one of four Victorian jam manufacturers to supply the military. But with so many men going into the services, there grew a scarcity in labour to help local farmers, especially at harvest time. Committees were formed to assist those whose sons or employees had gone to fight, and young boys were expected to step up and take on heavier workloads while young girls were encouraged to take those jobs like letter delivering that boys had traditionally done. 
To help boost recruiting in 1916, the government conducted a war census and had all eligible men fill in a call to arms form. Amongst the questions that were asked were, are you willing to enlist now? And if they said no, they had to then give a reason. 472 in the Shire sent back refusals, but these forms were then used by the Shire councillors who um, then had made, were making up the, the local recruiting committee and they went off and canvassed eligibles in their wards and encouraged them to volunteer. By now, there were also more examples of young men under the enlistment age lying about their true age in order to join up, as well as husbands joining the AIF and leaving wives and family behind to run the farm or the household. The terrible casualty numbers of the Song campaigns of, the 19, of 1916 discouraged many to enlist, which inspired the federal government to attempt to bring in compulsory conscription for the AIF. To do this, they wanted to gain the approval of the general public, and so put the issue to a vote through a referendum. Now, this started one of the most emotionally charged debates in our history. Locally, the council banned all anti-conscription meetings in Shire Halls, but they did allow pro-conscription meetings to take place. At one of these in Lilydale's Athenaeum Hall, Melba spoke, and in fact, Melba threatened to leave Lilydale if it voted against conscription. And as a result, Lilydale didn't vote against conscription. Another divisive vote uh, on conscription also took place in 1917. Throughout 1917, patriotic war work, appeals and fundraisers continued unabated, despite the shrinking availability that people had of spare time. During this time, visits by wounded soldiers to the area by the Volunteer Motor Corps continued. Now, one of the, uh, the notable individuals who assisted local men was Mrs Aeneas Gunn, author of the classic Australian novel, We of the Never Never. Now, before the war, she was a regular visitor to Mombolk and she came to know the people there very well. When the men from Mombolk enlisted in the war, she supported them, writing letters and sending parcels and knitting socks. In fact, she invented a special bracelet to hold wool so she could walk around and knit at the same time. And that's a picture of her on the left there uh, doing just that. She, uh, she placed a, uh, a photo of each of the men that she was supporting from Mombolk, some 77 men, on her mantelpiece. You can see it there, which is quite impressive. After the war, she continued to support them. She used her skills as a writer to uh, apply for pensions or soldier settlement grants, grants for them. Um, and this support continued for another 40 years until her death in 1961. She was later awarded the uh, OBE for her efforts. During 1917 and 1918, the el eligible pool of men was almost exhausted. And it was mainly schoolboys coming of age that were the ones who were enlisting. Those who didn't enlist came under enormous pressure and they were often abused or called shirkers or they were shunned by the community. As the war entered its fourth year, people were feeling an emotional exhaustion that, they, that came to be known as war weariness, especially as the war kept continuing year after year with no end in sight. Extra work and toil on the farms, most pastime given over to uh, war charities, and the ex anxiety over families serving overseas had all escalated by this stage. To help fund the war, the government put a national war loan and to in, uh, encourage uh, subscribers, they sent a war loan tank out to visit Lilydale, pictured here. Now, it's not really a tank. It's actually more a motor car with a, a dummy tank built over the top of it. And I think if you look closely at the bottom there, you can see the, uh, the, the wheels of the, uh, the car. Um, and that's the, uh, the bridge, the pedestrian bridge over uh, Maroondah Highway. Um, that uh, well, the railway bridge at that stage. Um, it's just in front of that. 
News of the armistice being signed first arrived in Lilydale late on the night of November 11th, when Dame Nellie Melba turned up in the main street and began ringing the fire bell. She had heard the news earlier by telephone and had raced into Lilydale to alert everyone there. People came out and an impromptu celebration took place in the centre of the town as everyone sang and danced while the brass band played songs. The following day, the word spread throughout the rest of the district. Some were at school when the news arrived, others at home. That night, huge bonfires were lit throughout the Shire and effigies of the Kaiser were burned. Over the coming days, more celebrations occurred. Although sick and wounded soldiers had been returning to the area since uh, late 1915, most didn't come home in large numbers until 1918. Most communities formed their own welcome home committees to organise the details of the events that would give the returning servicemen and women an official welcome home back home to the district. Those that arrived by train at one of the, the local railway stations were often greeted there by crowds of locals, along with the local brass band uh, playing. This uh, particular picture here is a special uh, picnic that was um, held to welcome home the, uh, the diggers of Mumbolk and, uh, and also uh, recognise their, uh, their mothers. Now, centred right in the centre there is none other than Prime Minister Billy Hughes, who um, actually had a, a holiday home not uh, far from there in Sassafras. And uh, pictured to his left there is uh, Mrs. Aeneas Gunn, who had uh, certainly supported the Mombolt diggers greatly during that, uh, that period. Following the uh, return of local men and women from the war came years of readjustment. Some had been physically maimed and spent years in hospitals or convalescent homes, like Michael Upton of uh, Coldstream, pictured on the, the left there, who lost a leg. Others would suffer mentally, like Mort Tate of Lilydale, who's pictured on the right there, who was severely affected by shell shock for the rest of his life and spent uh, most of his short life in, uh, in hospital. Those at home had to readjust as well. Loved ones had turned home, returned home changed by the war and loved ones who hadn't, um, who died, sorry, loved ones who had died hadn't returned home. The grief felt at the loss of so many hung like a dark cloud over many homes. By the war's end, the casualty numbers were so severe that everyone in the Shire had lost someone that they had known. Some former soldiers took up farming under the soldier settlement scheme. Some found it hard to either find or stay in a job. Others found it hard to relate to their families. They built memorials honoring those who had gone and they formed RSL clubs to fight for their rights. Anzac Day and Remembrance Day has helped to perpetuate their memory for generations uh, that were to follow. The First World War remains the one event that caused the greatest number of casualties for the Shire of Lilydale. And as such, it should be recognized as a significant part of its history. That terrible conflict had a major impact on all its residents, not just those who donned a uniform and risked their lives on the battlefront, but also those who toiled at home uh, under significant hardships to support them as well, lest uh, we forget. Thank you. And um, I might uh, now hand over to, um, to Bart, um, who is um, going to... Uh, officially launched the uh, the book for uh, for us at the the Mount Evelyn RSL. Thank you very much, Bart. Thanks, Anthony, and thanks for a terrific presentation uh, there. Yes, it's um, it's a real pleasure for me uh, actually to have a chance to uh, to talk about this book and uh, and to launch it officially. Uh, as uh, Heidi mentioned earlier, I'm a, uh, a senior lecturer at Deakin University, but uh, I guess more importantly, I uh, had my early days in Mount Evelyn, and uh, so it's a it's a personal interest to me uh, to be able to read this book and to uh, to talk about it as well. So, uh, so here I am to say a few words about uh, Anthony's uh, latest book. Uh, Heidi mentioned that he has twenty four of them. 
uh, which points to just how active uh, he's been in investigating the wartime past in the Shire of Lilydale. I'll speak a little bit about the, uh, the context uh, in which we might think about uh, this war experience and then uh, a little more closely about the, uh, the qualities of the book uh, itself. Any book like this on the uh, Australian home front during the First World War uh, has to attempt to answer some big questions. And one of those questions, of course, is to ask what effect did a war thousands of kilometres away have on local people? And that question implies with a good deal of truth that the Great War was something that happened to Australian people, uh, people who were situated literally on the other side of the world from where the main fighting was going on. But because this was a war that was of such a scale and of such a character uh, that it depended on civilians at home maintaining the materials and especially the will to keep fighting, uh, we also have to ask questions even of those Australians on the other side of the world, like how did people help to keep a war thousands of kilometres away going for over four years? What sort of effort did it take and why did they keep going in the face of the kinds of losses and the fears and the anxieties that Anthony was talking about uh, just now? So there's two sides of that coin. Uh, the war happens to Australians, but they're also really important in keeping it going. And historians used to answer questions like these, mostly by pointing to things like the power of governments to mobilise populations. So we would point at things like propaganda, uh, such as we'd see in recruiting posters, <coughs> excuse me, that encourage men to enlist, or posters asking people to subscribe to the latest war loan. Mm. Or we'd look at the media for the kind of rousing speeches that politicians like Billy Hughes, uh, as you just saw, uh, would make to keep uh, encouraging people to support the war by making their own sacrifices, perhaps by giving their time uh, or their money, as Madame Melba did, uh, but also making sacrifices like not holding their loved ones back from the fight. But these days, to answer questions like how did Australians at home fight and endure the Great War, we tend to look more closely at the communities like the ones that Anthony has just taken us into. And we look at those communities to see how they express themselves, what they did to support or oppose or attempt to moderate the effects of the war. Uh, Anthony referred very briefly to uh, some poetry uh, by J.D. Burns. But if you have a look at the book, uh, poetry is one of the recurring themes uh, and there's a whole series of really great examples in there of the kinds of poetry that people were producing. And it's not just there for colour. It's there uh, as a way of letting us hear how people felt about this war, how they felt about their involvement in it, uh, what was at stake for them uh, from things like the principles of international relations, all the way through to fears of losing those who they love most. One of the um, most affecting quotes in this book, I think, uh, is from uh, Isabella Boyd of Lilydale. And you'll find it when you get your book and, uh, and read it, you'll find it on page 38. And it reads like this. Uncle George went off early and he was in the thick of it. All throughout the war, all my grandmother wanted to do was live long enough to see him again. Now, that might sound a little bit melodramatic, uh, but I suspect we should take that statement at face value. It's a, it's a statement that begins, I think, to get us inside two elements of the war at home uh, that this book really helps us to understand. The first element is, is the intensity of the worry and the fear that came with having a loved one away. And the second, is the level of devotion that Australians at home felt for their soldiers and nurses at the front, who are otherwise, of course, sons and daughters, husbands and fathers, brothers and sisters, cousins and friends. Now, both of those things drove people to continue exerting themselves and to keep supporting the war uh, via the men and the women at the front. Now, it's not an easy thing 
uh, to bring us a century after these events into that world of feeling and to try to have us understand what that must have been like. So how does Anthony achieve that in this book? Uh, well, one is simply through his choice of a, a very close local uh, case study, which gets us much closer to the ground than a study of, say, politicians and others on the national stage. But I think the real virtue of this book, and you'll see it when you read it, um, is that it has taken a long time to bring those voices together. Now, Anthony said at the start that this book comes out of uh, the centenary and, and some grant money that became available. But what you'll see is in fact that in, in effect, Anthony's been researching this book for more than 30 years. If you, uh, if you have a look at the long list of people in the acknowledgements who are no longer with us, you'll start to realise that so many of the people who feature in this book are those to whom Anthony actually spoke. Uh, families have given him access to their personal papers and their photographs, and he's carefully excavated the local press for the gems that are hidden there. Now, these are things that take time, they take effort, they take commitment, and I think a great deal of sensitivity as well. And, uh, and we really are the lucky beneficiaries of that effort in this book. So Anthony's achievement, I think, uh, is to bring back to us those people across the Shire of Lilydale who made that war effort. Uh, they made it, it wasn't just visited upon them, they made that war effort through their dedication, uh, but also in their heartbreak. Uh, and also it has to be said in their prejudice and their intolerance as well, if we think about that meeting uh, that sought to have people of German and Austrian uh, background interned. The threads of the, the Great War really wove themselves through those communities, through the endeavours of their own people. And through histories like the one that Anthony's produced here, I think we might begin to see those people more clearly and we might begin uh, to appreciate better the depth and the, com sorry, the complexity uh, of their experience. So with that in mind, I am absolutely delighted to commend this book to you and uh, I have great pleasure in declaring it officially uh, to be launched. So thank you and congratulations, Anthony, on this great achievement. Thank you, Bart. Thank you. Really uh, appreciate that. Um, um, the, uh, we were going to um, now have the, the president um, of the, the Mount Evelyn RSL, um, Matt Crimble, uh, he wanted to say a few words. Um, Matt uh, is a customs officer uh, currently serving on a, um, a, a sort of border force uh, ship somewhere off the coast of Australia. He was hoping to, um, uh, to be able to, uh, to be here via Zoom. Um, but it looks like he, uh, he hasn't, but um, he had um, previously, just in case there were going to be uh, uh, disruptions, that uh, he did send to, uh, th through to me what he wanted to say. Um, so um, just bear with me. I'll um, just read out what, um, what Matt wanted to say. So on behalf of the Mount Evelyn RSL, RSL sub-branch, Matt would like to acknowledge a number of individuals and groups that have helped make uh, this project possible. Firstly, to the Department of Veterans Affairs, Australian Government Armistice Centenary Grant Program, who provided a grant to fund the publication. Our thanks also to the Honourable Tony Smith, MP, Federal Member for Casey, and his team at his office for their support. Our thanks also to uh, Dr. Bart Zeno, Senior Lecturer at uh, Deakin University and proud Man Evelyn boy. Uh, for writing the foreword and for uh, his magnificent words just then in launching the, uh, the book. Our appreciation to the uh, Eastern Regions Library and especially Heidi Bell for working with us to, uh, to bring the launch uh, to you today online via Zoom. And um, this is, uh, is being recorded and will be put up on their, their website. And there were a couple of people who um, had tried to, uh, to get on and for some reason the technology didn't work for them. Uh, they may very well be watching it later on. So we, we do put our apologies to them if they couldn't get on sort of uh, live. But uh, we're, we're very happy that um, the library has been able to make this available for people to watch later. 
Um, now, a book as detailed as this requires a lot of research, and we acknowledge the work undertaken by volunteers who have coll collated wonderful archives for their community groups um, that we were uh, able to, uh, to access. Most notably, the uh, Lilydale and District Historical Society, the Mount Dandenong Historical Society, the Mombolk Historical Society, the Murrubark History Group, the Mount Evelyn History Group, the Wandon uh, Historical Society, Mondelanzi Homestead and Museum, the Mombolk RSL Subbranch, the Lilydale RSL Subbranch, the Yarra Rangers Regional Museum, the Athenaeum Theatre Company, and the Seville Township Group Incorporated. Thank you also to the numerous uh, individuals, um, as Bart mentioned, many of those have uh, now passed away, that shared their uh, memories or their families' archives. Uh, our appreciation also to Joy Phillips from Federal, Feral Art, who uh, did an amazing job designing and typesetting the, uh, the publication, especially the, uh, the images, they've come up really well. Um, and it's, uh, it really does look good. Now, if you uh, want to purchase a, uh, a copy of the, uh, the book that we have here, we have um, placed the book uh, for sale on, uh, on eBay. So you can certainly uh, go to uh, eBay. Um, uh, the Man Evelyn RSL has set up a, a page on there where we're selling um, all of our, uh, our books. Um, all you need to do is go to eBay and just um, if you just key in the title of the of the book, Homefront, the impact of the First World War on the Shire of Lilydale, in the search box, you should be able to find it okay, and then you'll be able to uh, either uh, buy it through uh, using credit card or uh, PayPal. It'll be sent out to you. Otherwise, if you um, you could always um, if you want to use cash, you can uh, call into the Mount Evelyn Mount Evelyn RSL club rooms on a Thursday afternoon. They're always open then. Um, and you can uh, buy it there for, uh, for $30. But um, thank you everyone for, uh, for attending. Um, and uh, thank you also to, to those who've come later to watch the, the recording. Thank you also uh, to, to Heidi again, and I'll hand over to uh, Heidi for the, the final words. Does everyone, anyone have any questions for Anthony or, or Bart? <laughs> Yes, hello, it's John Howell here, Heidi. Yep, hi John. Uh, I know Anthony and that, I had a little contact with you, Bart, a few years ago, but I think you're at La Trobe then, so how long ago was that? Oh uh, yeah, it was a few years ago, It'd be, uh, what year are we in now? Gosh, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it would be about 15 years, so there you go. Oh really? No, I'll, no, it wasn't that long ago, anyway, okay, that's a side issue. Um, <laughs> Anthony, you mentioned uh, internment uh, at one point. Um, were there many locals interned and, and where, where were they interned? Was there any internment in the Yarra Valley? No, there was, uh, I can't find any um, examples of anyone that was in, interred. There was, um, mm -hmm. uh, and this similar sort of case in World War II, that uh, especially when we had a large uh, Italian community at Wandon and Sylvan is um, what they uh, preferred to do is to um, is to have um, what that was termed as enemy aliens um, register with the the police and they would have to on a weekly basis uh, report into the uh, the police. the uh, The closest um, account that we have to that is there was a German uh, there was a woman living in Lilydale. Her husband was a German national. But he had left her and her son and their son uh, before the, uh, the war had started. And somewhere in New South Wales, he uh, ended up being interned at, um, at Holsworthy um, uh, sort of uh, camp. Um, and um, he was um, interned there. And when the war finished, the government said, we're sending you back to, uh, to Germany. You're, you're out of here. Oh. And much to uh, the surprise of his uh, wife is that um, he requested that she join him in uh, oh. his trek to, uh, to Germany, to which he quickly wrote back to the, the government saying, no, thank you very much. There's no way known I'm leaving my sort of happy home to, uh, to go to somewhere where um, I don't speak the language or know the people, and especially with someone who didn't treat me very well anyway. So that was probably the, uh, the closest we came. Okay, thank you. There's some good stories in the book by the sound of things. That's a good one. 
think you had your hand up, Arthur. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Anthony, thank you very much for, for doing this. Um, Anthony and Valerie and I know uh, one another through our work down there at Lilydale High School. And um, I've been away from uh, out of Australia for just over 14 years and just recently returned. Anthony, you've been busy. I didn't realize you'd written that many books. Um, so I'll make an observation and I'll put a question to you. The observation is this, that your book reminds me of how significant World War II is in Australia's history compared to that in the United States. Uh, there's several reasons for that. One is the United States came into the war much later than Australia did. Another reason I would suggest is Sorry, that- Sorry, Arthur, uh, you said World War II. Are you World, talking World about World War I? I? Yeah, yeah, World War I. Um, another reason is that uh, given Australia's circumstances, the impact was, was so great here uh, compared to that, I think, in the United States. So a book like yours, uh, where somebody looks at a local community and the impact of that war, I don't think there'd be too many people in the United States even contemplating a work like that. So well done on that one. The question I have for you is that I can recall seeing World War I propaganda that would have German soldiers in the outback, uh, burning houses and so on, you know, putting fear into people here that Germany was set to invade Australia. Did you come across anything uh, specific to Lilydale where people were expressing fears that the Germans were going to be down at Lilydale Station next week if we didn't do something mm -hmm. to stop them? Yes, very much so. The um, the fear of uh, of, uh, of invasion. No, nope, didn't hear me. Uh, yes, certainly. Can you hear me? Can you hear me at the moment? Yes. No, I'll, uh, I'll press, press on. Um, the uh, the fear of invasion. Is um, is something that um, uh, certainly had been uh, around for, um, for for decades. Um, it uh, at one stage there was fear that the um, the Russians would um, uh, turn up on our uh, doorstep, um, which is why those big guns were built down at um, Point Nepean and um, and at uh, Queenscliff to uh, protect Port Phillip Bay in case the uh, the Russians turned up. Um, then in uh, the early part of uh, the, the 20th century, um, when um, the Japanese um, had victories over uh, Russia uh, in, uh, in, in sort of um, in uh, Manchuria and such like that, there was fears that uh, the Japanese were going to come and take over Australia, even as early as, you know, sort of the uh, 1910s. And um, the reason they said is that, you know, we've got fast land, we've got, um, you know, certainly got a lot of um, uh, things that uh, resources and that open, that, uh, of course, they will want to take that. Now, when uh, World War I came along and we had a definite enemy, the Germans, it just, they just transported the, um, the, 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 the enemy from, uh, away from being the Japanese to being the Germans, and certainly there's the the posters that you know they're going to turn up on our doorstep, um, and certainly in you know sort of with the, a lot of the recruiting sort of um, rallies that happened locally, there was this talk that you know the Germans were going to come here unless we all go and you know fight them over there. Um, during the conscription um, uh, debates, it was being used again there. In fact, Melba claimed that when she was in Germany, she overheard two um, Germans saying that, you know, Australia and New Zealand were going to be their chief prize. And she uh, stood up to them and uh, told them no, that she knows Australians, you know, sort of uh, very well. And they, they won't accept that. Whether that was true or not, I don't know. But, you know, certainly it's a good story. But that um, the fear of invasion is a, um, was a common one. They just changed it over to the uh, to be coming Germans when they had a definite enemy. Then later on, um, after World War One, it went back to that Asian fear, and that Asian fear then became a communist fear in the 1950s and 60s. But this, and you know, sort of traditional historical uh, anxiety of being invaded um, certainly is um, was around for a long, long time. Valerie's got her hand up. You're Valerie. on mute, Valerie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. Wonderful. Um, uh, just a question about the school children 
uh, remember the drive for the pennies for um, supporting the the school in Villas Bretonne. I'm just mm -hmm. wondering, um, are, are you aware of schools around here um, taking part in that? And do you know how you'd find out about it? There's a special connection um, that I'd really like to find out, this little school in Callista. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, I know, you know, there are other schools around too, but do you know if, how, if um, ch children around here contributed to that? Certainly, and what um, what Val's talking about is, um, for those that don't know, is that uh, after World War One, that uh, the uh, the little school at uh, at Villas Bretonneau had been destroyed during the war, and that uh, the Victorian school children uh, took um, on a an appeal to um, to raise enough money to um, uh, to buy a new school. Um, now, I don't have any definite um, sort of um, uh, evidence to say that local schools uh, were involved in that. I can only assume they would have been because it was certainly encouraged through the Victorian Education Department and through the state school system that they would um, certainly be uh, involved. But certainly I know that uh, Robinvale up near the, um, the, the Murray was, uh, was one uh, uh, little town, little school that, uh, that did a lot that raised, uh, they may have even raised the most amount of money, I think, um, and uh, this, as a result, there's a certain uh, a special connection between Villas Bretonneau and, and Robinvale as a result. Okay, thank you. And do you know how you'd find out about that, Anthony? Where would you go to find uh, out? I would, uh, I would suggest go to Trove first off. Um, the uh, Trove have done a fantastic job. Every single newspaper in Australia between 14 and 18 is now up on Trove. Wow. Um, so you can go along there and, um, and, and let's say for... 18, 19, uh, just key in, um, you know, sort of the uh, Villas Bretno Drive or, you know, sort of Villas Bretno School. Um, and it would certainly bring up the uh, articles that are connected there. Remembering, of course, that, you know, the local papers from that period are, are brilliant, absolutely brilliant. The amount of detailed information on local history is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Mm. I mean, someone would get married and they'd have a, you know, a complete sort of, you know, description of what happened and, um, and who um, gave what and, and things like that. Um, any speech in the, the local uh, hall was uh, was all recorded down and placed in the the local paper. It's uh, They're absolutely brilliant uh, minds of uh, information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I just mention, there is a, a book uh, by uh, Rosalie Triolo. At, uh, she's at oh, Monash University. I know her. No, I know, you know her. Rosalie? Well, I, yeah, I met her, asked yeah. her directly. Uh, Val, she wrote a book called Our Schools and the War. And uh, okay. if anyone knows where those records might be, uh, she'd be your first oh, contact. Oh, wow, thank you so much for mm -hmm. that. Oh, no problem at all. Might say on uh, in relation to those images of uh, Germans in the outback, uh, it, was, it was sort of reasonably frequently suggested that uh, Australians didn't appreciate uh, what was going on uh, on the other side of the world. It was especially after the, uh, the, the loss of the conscription campaigns. And so posters like that were often an attempt to sort of bring home to Australians that, uh, well, this could happen here. Uh, I always like to point out that those posters were drawn by the same fellow who uh, then very soon after wrote the uh, magic pudding. And so, um, you know, this is beautiful book for children uh, compared with these uh, sort of ape-like pictures of Germans. So you know, it's always a neat little contrast. And there was certainly uh, an attempt to uh, replicate uh, here what had uh, happened in Belgium, uh, because at the time there was, in the early part of the war, there was so many stories about the atrocities in Belgium. It was a, a com one of the common phrases is, you know, about babies being bayoneted on the uh, the doorsteps, um, you know, sort of, uh, it, you know, some were exaggerated, some were quite true of the horrific uh, accounts of what happened in uh, in Belgium. And it was certainly a way of galvanising people to uh, to uh, support the uh, the war effort. Um, and a lot of those posters were, were really connecting with those stories and replicating them uh, here in Australia, saying this could happen as well, because people were so familiar with what was happening with uh, in Belgium. Hmm. 
Anyone else got any questions or comments? <laughs> uh, I have one. The, yeah. the, thank you, Anthony, and congratulations for your 24th book. Just wondering the, what would be your next book call? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well done, Raman. In fact, um, <laughs> this is probably, um, I don't have uh, any uh, pressure on me to uh, produce any more because we haven't got any outstanding grants. So um, I can have a bit of a rest at the, uh, at the moment. Um, although there are certainly uh, some uh, interesting projects in the pipeline uh, that, um, that uh, I've got uh, through the, the Mount Evelyn RSL, we've got a former president who um, was in Bomber Command during uh, World War II, um, and he left the, uh, the club his, um, his war diaries, uh, and they are extraordinary. Not only the fact that he, was, he survived Bomber Command, but he also uh, then went on to fly bombers in the Pacific as well. Um, and uh, so, look, at, at some stage, we're hoping we'll be able to, uh, to get that, uh, that published. But um, yes, look for the the time being. I might even have a, a bit of a rest um, uh, next year, Raman. So um, yes, thank you for asking. Oh, beauty. Thank you. However, I might um, I will just actually hand over to Bart because Bart is uh, just about to um, complete a major uh, work on uh, Australia during World War One uh, on the home front. I wonder if Bart, you could sort of talk about about that. Oh, that's very kind of you, uh, Anthony. Yes, look, I've been plugging away for, uh, for a long time on a book uh, about private sentiment in Australia during the First World War. And it's yeah, heard of been, uh, an attempt to uh, get inside how people felt about the First World War. And uh, I guess to explain some of those phenomena that Anthony was talking about in terms of things like war weariness and, uh, and to try and answer that question about how people kept going all through that uh, that terrible sort of conflict that they had. Uh, and we do find that people really do struggle, in fact, to get to the end of this war. And uh, there are a lot of them asking for their sons, in fact, to be sent back um, by the time we get to uh, the period after the Battle of the Somme in 1916 and then Ypres in 1917. We do see people writing to the Defence Department saying, look, I just can't keep going, worrying about my son. Uh, you've got to do something about this so uh, we did you know for us we we grow up knowing that we won this war um, and sometimes it's hard to put ourselves back in the shoes of people who didn't know uh, whether they would come out on top of this or and didn't know whether their kids were coming back and uh, when we do that uh, we start to see just how emotionally scarring this war was so uh, I'm grateful for the chance to plug that at the, the book well, it's not finished and uh, it'll be a year or two uh, before we see it. But if I get a chance to plug it again, uh, even with, with a kind group like yourselves, then um, I'll be there. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, appreciate that. Arthur, yeah. Yes, I, I'm considering we're um, still dealing with uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic, We've been hearing a lot about the Spanish flu, the influenza. Is there anything in your book about that, Anthony? Certainly, it's um, the um, the Spanish uh, flu. You know, it certainly um, it, it had a major effect on our uh, our servicemen. There was probably about uh, I think about thirty five servicemen who died of um, influenza during 1918, 1919. Um, and it probably had more of an effect on those fellows than what it did on the home front. Um, the uh, on the home front, they were they were quite active um, in sort of uh, in combating it. Uh, Doctor Arthur Syme, who was the the local doctor, the Shire appointed him uh, in charge. And uh, when it hit in 1919, there was just about to be a uh, new school opened known as the Lilydale Elementary High School. And what the, uh, the government did was, uh, sorry, the Shire did, is they took over that school before it was opened and they prepared that to be an influenza hospital. Um, mm. And there were a lot of the volunteers who had already previously volunteered with the Red Cross uh, jumped in and, and were prepared to, uh, to help out. 
However, as it worked out, they didn't need to. There was um, mass um, vac uh, vaccination. Um, they gave people the flu vaccination, not the Spanish flu, but a flu vaccination, which certainly um, helped um, a lot of people. Um, and um, as far as I can tell, there was uh, there was only one death, and it was a, a young girl up in uh, the Dandenongs. Uh, but certainly there was there was things like mask wearing. Um, there was um, uh, you know, sort of a lot of um, anxiety for people who were, you know, worked at the railway station or worked in a, in a bank. Um, but for this, this area, the Spanish flu, thankfully, didn't hit too hard. What probably was, um, you know, sort of more dangerous was uh, diphtheria, um, which certainly hit the, uh, the convent school a number of times. And there was a number of um, uh, young boarders who um, lived there. That were um, sort of affected by the, the the diphtheria over the uh, the years, but certainly the Spanish flu, although a you know direct result of you know sort of being um, spread on the uh, on the Western Front and then being brought home by the uh, the fellows as they returned home, um, didn't have a major impact on this area, but it certainly it did you know sort of uh, with uh, in regards to Victoria, I think there was about four and a half thousand just in Victoria that uh, that died of the Spanish flu. Any more questions? Now, it's at this point we, uh, we forgot to tell you that there is a test, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Could I um, just quickly, I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that um, Anthony and the, uh, the Mount Evelyn RSL have uh, been very generous in dedicating this book to a, a fellow by the name of Luke Hollier. And... Uh, Luke, I understand, was uh, was very much a presence around the RSL for a long time. Uh, he's also a friend of mine uh, in my younger days, and uh, he's uh, he's very much missed, in fact. So I think it was a very generous thing uh, for Anthony and the RSL to uh, dedicate the book to him. Yeah, certainly, and it's um, you know he was uh, he was a lovely fellow, and um, uh, you know, and sort of passed away very young, um, and. Um, and still to this day, you know, around the uh, the town, people talk of him in glowing terms and um, and and talk about how much they they miss him. So certainly, it's uh, you know, it was great to have that opportunity to to get dedicate that to, to him as well. So that was really nice. Mm. Well, I think that's about it for today. So I'd like to thank Anthony and also Bart for joining us and. We wish them every luck and good promotion for their book. And I look forward to seeing what else you write soon, Tony. <laughs> so might say goodbye for today and we will see you again either at the library or around the community very soon. Thank you. 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 Thank you.